I invite you as you're settling in your seat, if you would, uh, walk with me into the Word of God to Acts chapter 17. Um, while you're opening up the Bible and getting ready to just lean into the Word and say hello to everybody who's worshiping with us online today. I know it's summertime and people are traveling and going about all the things. And so I hope that you have something scheduled to just, just fun to be away with your family. Uh, happy Father's Day, dads. Can we celebrate dads? We thank you for all that you do. We want to honor you today. As you heard earlier, make sure you get a little treat as you head out today. Um, it is good to be in God's house. Acts chapter 17, that's where we're going to be in just a minute. Um, again, I want to invite you to continue to be praying for our students. Uh, we had an amazing group of kids um, out at Victory Mountain last week, tons of people making decisions for Jesus, uh, people accepting Christ for the first time, people making new professions of faith, people filling callings and leadings into different types of ministry, high school camp starts today. Um, so make sure that you're praying for our students and uh, excited about what God's going to do in their lives. All right, y'all ready to go into the Word of God together? Say amen. Um, if you are new to Vintage, you picked a really good time to start hanging out with us because over the last several weeks, you're getting a good window into who we hope to be as a church. I know that there's a lot of curiosity for people who have never been in this building about who we are and what we believe and what we do. And I get questions all the time because people, maybe, maybe your introduction to our church was when you started to ride down Academy Street and you peered across the parking lot over the liquor store <laughs> or perhaps from the liquor store. I'm not judging, just an observation. That was uncomfortable, but funny at the same time. When, uh, <laughs> but you drive down this street and on this building that maybe when you're from Random and you know that this used to be a Lowe's Foods and grocery store, and now it says Vintage Church, and it makes you curious because it perhaps is a unique name for a church, especially if you grew up in the church, especially if you grew up in the South. We're not used to hearing churches with that kind of language. We're used to hearing a number, a denomination, and then church. Come on. That's how most of us grew up. We grew up in, in number, denomination, church. And I get it. I understand it. This is not uh, an indictment on any of that, but there's a very intentional reason why we call this vintage church. I grew up in the church. I grew up in the name, denomination, and church, just like you did, or many of you did. And, and uh, my church experience, like most of yours, was a mixed bag of things, right? There was beauty and brokenness as a part of my experience. There were moments where I saw the amazingly beautiful side of church that meant so much to me, to my family, that shaped the foundation of my faith. My faith. But then I saw the other side of that coin as well. I saw the broken side that was hard and difficult, and at times, ugly and painful, but God called me to serve his church, and I felt it very deep in my spirit. Uh, and in 2006, I was pastoring in the little country church in the small little area of South Carolina, and God planted me in the book of Acts for quite some time. And I just started reading through the book of Acts, and, and I would read it, and then I would read it again, and then I would read it, and then I would read it, and then I would read it. And what I discovered was there was just something about this historical record of the first century church, the first to follow through with the mission that Jesus gave his people. And there was something about it I saw on a page that I'd never seen with my own eyes, at least not consistently. I saw this beautiful expression of the body of Christ that was so vibrant and powerful that it said every single day people were getting saved. It was this melting pot of believers from different walks of life and different nationalities and different places, and they weren't segregated by denominationalism. They weren't separated by unimportant things. It was not about any one man's agenda. It seemed to only be about the mission of Jesus and I felt something stirring in my spirit. And it's not that God, y'all do know God has always been working. He is always working. He will always be working in and through his church. Come on, somebody. Y'all with me? He is always working. Like there's never been a moment when God said, I'm going to take a day off. The psalmist says he never sleeps. He never slumbers. He never is not working. But I wanted to be a part of something, something different than my experience, at least. And so the word vintage in the dictionary means representing the high quality of a past time. 
And I've said throughout this series, I know that we can't recreate what they experienced. I mean, God says in his word, see, I'm doing a new thing. Don't you perceive it? I didn't, I didn't want to replicate their experience, but what I discovered was what made this New Testament church, y'all, so vibrant, so beautiful, so powerful, was not some elaborate strategy. They didn't have committee meetings where they figured out what kind of music they were gonna do and how to debate over the style of worship and what kind of instruments would or would not be allowed on the platform. Ain't that weird? Um, it, they didn't even have what we would consider to be really useful tools. They didn't have buildings and air conditioning and lights, and they didn't have any of those things. And don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to demonize. I, I, don't, I, don't, I, I think we should be strategic. You're gonna hear more about that today. I, I think we should leverage the tools that God has given us for his glory, and that we should use the things that we can in order to make the name of Jesus known. But what they had was a healthy culture. What they had was an intentional culture. And if you don't have a healthy and intentional culture, all the tools and all the strategy will just fall flat. It can look healthy from the outside, but if inside it's not healthy, it's not, it's not focusing on the right things, it's not rooted in the right principles, it's not centered around the name of Jesus only, then even if you draw a crowd, you're not building a church. There's a difference. And what I observed was some things in that culture that I wanted to help create in the culture that, of the church that God was calling me to plant. And over the last 17 years, I've tried, along with so many of you, to ensure that we have a culture that aligns with Scripture. Because as I've submitted to you throughout this series, if we do not have a culture that aligns with Scripture, we will not make disciples that look like Jesus. If we do not have a culture that aligns with Scripture, we will not make disciples that look like Jesus. And I'm talking about the Jesus of the Bible. The Jesus of the Gospels, the Jesus of the Scriptures. I know that there's, it seems like I hear people, we want to create a, a culturally comfortable Jesus. One that's maybe not as offensive or what, it, but the Jesus of the Bible, because if we're not producing as a church disciples that look like Jesus, then we need to stop calling ourselves a church because that's not what we are. And what I've discovered was there were, there were things in this culture that they seem, culture is really, really set by, by values, what you value. And so there were, there were four kind of core values that I knew that we needed to hold on to and we would need to protect. And no matter what would change, and a lot has changed in the last 17 years. We've been in three different middle schools and now a grocery store that we've called home on Sundays. There's been a, a, a revolving door of, of volunteers and leaders and different things. And there's a lot about the way that we have approached church that has changed. But there's some things that no matter how much time goes by, they must remain consistent. There are some principles that have been the, the guardrails of the culture of our church that we've held on to and used as a filter for how we make decisions and how we operate as a church. And as we're finishing up this series, we're calling This Is Vintage, we've just started to lean into them. Starting with week one, talking about the importance of intentional relationships that we value intentional relationships mainly because it is so clear all throughout the Bible that that's what God values. I submit to you the whole of the gospel is God through Jesus intentionally doing what was necessary to restore the relationship that was broken by sin in the garden. Like the whole of the gospel, that like God created humanity and created us to live in relationship with him. And that relationship was so intentional. He set boundaries and parameters and we violated that and sin entered the world. It severed that relationship. And from that moment on, all of the scripture is God setting in his plan of redemption to not establish a religion, but restore a relationship. And we need to value relationships. And I submit that discipleship requires relationship. That's the way Jesus modeled to us, amen? That Jesus said, come follow me. He invited these guys into intentional relationship with himself to show them what it meant to know, live for, and love God and walk in truth in obedience to his word. And I love that we have mediums like online. I love that we have access to content. But discipleship doesn't happen by simply going through the right program. It happens through being around the right people that pour into our lives. 
We're in an age where we can consume content like crazy. Come on. We have the internet. And look, look at me. Be careful. YouTube will take you down a theological black hole that you might have a hard time climbing back out of. So, so just be careful. But if you consume even the right content, but live outside of the right community that give you the accountability and the encouragement and the prayer and all the things that we need from each other as the body of Christ, then it will stunt our spiritual growth. And last week we talked about how as you walk through the word of God, whether it be through the book of Acts or all of scripture, we value inspirational leadership because God has throughout history raised up men and women given the torch of, of stewarding well the influence they've been given for God's glory. And leadership matters, y'all. We've said a thousand times, and you, all you have to do is just, is just pay attention in a little bit, and you see constantly we watch pastors and leaders fall and fail in a, in a way that's just... And we're all kind of tired of it. We need people to, of character and integrity to steward well the platforms that we've been given that will wear the title of pastor or teacher or whatever it is in God's kingdom, understanding that the influence that we're giving will be held accountable for how we use it or misuse it. And one of those leaders that we looked at last week was Paul. How through so much of the book of Acts is Paul leveraging his influence for the glory of God to go from community to community and preach the gospel to tell people about their need for salvation and that salvation is found only in Jesus Christ, that every human has a deep spiritual need, that we are all sinners in need of a savior. We are severed from our creator and there's nothing that we could ever do to make it right. We could not work hard enough, serve hard enough, give enough, that we are separated from God and nothing we could do can close that gap, which in God and his grace and his goodness said, you can't close it, so I will. So Jesus came, God incarnate, fully man, fully God, lived a completely sinless life and died as the necessary sacrifice on the cross, died the death that you and I deserve so that we could have life. And when we look to his sacrifice and trust in it for our salvation, we can be made right with him. Amen. And Paul would simply go from town to town with that message. And in Acts chapter 17, we see him continuing to live out that calling in a way that I think we can learn from, in a way that I think we individually should glean lessons from, and that we corporately as the church should learn from. So go to Acts chapter 17. In a minute, I'm going to start with verse 16, and I'm going to read all the way down to about verse 34. I know that's a lot of verses from the Bible, but this is church. Come on. Let me set kind of the context. Remember, last week we were in Acts chapter 17, because Acts 16, you see Paul go into Philippi. And once again, do the same thing he's doing. He goes and he engages this woman named Lydia, leads her to Jesus. Her home becomes the home for the church in its infancy at Philippi. And he leverages his influences for the glory of God. And this church is born. And eventually he moves on and he goes to Thessalonica. And he's only there for, it says, three Sabbaths, so about three weeks. And again, he shares his faith. He establishes a church. And now he's about to move on. And he steps into another city a city that was once the, the epicenter of the Greek culture. And I want you to just see the way that he approaches sharing Jesus in this place and be reminded that, that everything in the Bible is, is very intentionally placed there by God. Come on. There are things that we learn from in every single place in Scripture that the Acts is not just like this, this narrative account of history that we're supposed to just read and dismiss. Who they are and what they did are lessons for us to glean from about who we are and what we're supposed to do. Acts chapter 17, start with verse 16. You ready for the word of God? Say amen. amen. Verse 16, it says, while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was deeply distressed when he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with those who worship God, as well as in the marketplace every day with those who happen to be there. 
Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also debated with him. Some said, what is this ignorant show-off trying to say? Others replied, he seems to be a preacher of foreign deities because he was telling the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. They took him and brought him into the Areopagus and said, may we learn about this new teaching you are presenting? Because what you say sounds a little strange to us. And we want you to know, and we want to know what these things mean. Verse 21, now all the Athenians and the foreigners residing there spent their time on nothing else but telling or hearing something new. Paul stood in the middle of the Areopagus and said, people of Athens, I see that you are extremely religious in every respect. For as I was passing through and observing the objects of your worship, I even found an altar on which was inscribed to an unknown God. Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, he is the Lord of heaven and earth. Does not, he does not live in shrines made by hands. Verse 25, neither is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives everyone life and breath and all things. From one man, he has made every nationality to live over the whole earth and has determined their appointed times and the boundaries of where they would live. Verse 27, he did this so that we might seek God and perhaps they might reach out and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him, we live and move and have our being as even some of our own poets have said, or some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Since then, we are God's offspring. We shouldn't think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image fashioned by human art and imagination. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God now commands all people everywhere to repent because he has set a day when he is going to judge the world in righteousness by the man he has appointed. He has also provided proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some began to ridicule him, but others said, we'd like to hear from you again about this. So Paul left their presence. However, some people joined him and believed. And now I think there's so much that we can learn from this moment of Paul engaging people to share his faith that we need to, we need to learn from this moment about how we're supposed to engage people and share our own faith, both individually and collectively. It starts with right there in verse 16. Look at it. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was deeply distressed when he saw that the city was full of idols. It's so powerful what is said in just this one verse that we can just skip right over and not even understand what's happening. It says, Paul goes into this new city and he begins to just walk around and observe. Paul goes in and he begins to study the culture in which he is now called to see what he can glean about who they are so he can introduce them to who he knows. There's something special and powerful about that. I know it's tough to navigate being in the world and not of the world, amen? It's tough to find that balance of being present in the culture in which we live and walking against the grain of that culture as we're called to as followers of Christ, amen? And navigating that tension of being in the culture and not being overly influenced by the culture and being an influencer on the culture is really difficult, but I think it's powerful that, that we don't need to be like the culture, but we can't be indifferent to a culture that we're called to reach. We can't be ignorant of a world we're called to influence. There's a certain measure of, of, of paying attention, of knowing in order to understand how to engage, of seeing 
what's happening, what they're reaching for, what they're searching for in order to understand how to connect with them in a real tangible way that gives us a voice among them to lead them towards Jesus. That Paul spends time observing and paying attention. And now, I know that's a difficult balance, and I wish I could take the whole message of us just kind of having conversations about how do, you, how do you walk that tightrope of being in the world and not of it, of being present in a culture and not letting it influence you more than you influence it. But this is what I know. We have to understand it on some measure if we're going to be able to resonate it in a way that brings truth into it. Maybe we need to stop always just complaining about the culture and maybe try to understand it in a way on some level that allows us to tell them about the hope we have in Christ because they need it. And that's what Paul discovered. He walks around and he sees all these idols and he gleans from that. These people know they need something. These people know that they, they have a deep desire to hold on to something bigger than them. They know that there's something missing and they haven't been able to find it. So they keep creating idol after idol after idol, some stone, some gold, some silver, like they're using every material and everything they can to create something because they know there's something in them that's missing. And they still know they haven't found it because they have this one that says to an unknown God that we've yet to find because we're still searching. It's not a different culture than ours. You do know that, right? It's a different time, but we still have people trying to latch on to idols. Y'all have heard me say for 17 years, I deeply believe every human, because every human is created by God, is created with a God-shaped hole in their soul. And so many people spend decades trying to shove something other than God in it, and it does not work. It doesn't work. A lot of us can testify because we've tried it. We didn't create animals out of gold to worship. We didn't, make, but no, we, we thought, you know what? If I can just marry the right person, I'll be whole. And man, that puts pressure on a marriage that it, when you try to get something from someone that only God can give you, that is a weight that will crush them every time. Oh, if I could just have a kid. Oh, if I could just get a promotion. Oh, if I just had $20 more thousand dollars a year. We know that because like, you know what you get when you get $20 more thousand dollars more? You spend 20 more grand. And so many people are searching and he's observing and he says, this is, this is what I see. He sees a, a culture that's missing what he knows they need. Because see, Paul tried that. Paul tried religion. When we meet him, he's this Pharisee, and he had gotten so consumed by keeping religious law and following traditions and doing all the things that his culture, his religious culture he grew up in said that he needed, and he knew it was missing until that day on the road to Damascus when the one he had been searching for met him right where he was, and it changed him forever. And now he sees they're searching for something that I know that I have that I must tell them about. And now he has to figure out, all right, how does he tell them? How does he gain an audience with these people to be able to share the good news of the gospel? And I think there's something to be learned from the way he goes about it. Because the way that he goes about teaching, preaching, sharing the gospel with the people of the er Areopagus, their Areopagus, was very different than his approach when he walked into the synagogues. It's very different. When he walked into the synagogues and now he's trying to convert people who were living under that Jewish system, trying to get them to see that the answer is right in front of them. Like they hold the answers in their Jewish texts in their Hebrew Bibles. They, they, they hold, like he, he opens up the text and says, here in Isaiah, that's Jesus. Here in Leviticus, that's Jesus. Here in Genesis 3, that, that's God pointing to Jesus. His approach with the people that had come out of that Jewish tradition was one way, but his approach in the Areopagus was totally different than his approach in the synagogue. 
he knew that he would have to have a different approach with a different audience if he was gonna break through and get them to listen to what he had to say. There's something to be learned there, church. There's something to be learned. He, he had an awareness. He knew that the way that I try to get them to give credence to my voice, the way I try to get an opportunity to have a door open for me to share about Jesus is going to be diff very different with this group of people than it was for that group of people. Look at verse 23. He says, for I was passing through and observing the objects of your worship. I even found an altar on which was inscribed to an unknown God. He immediately steps in and says, I've been paying attention. I've been looking around and he meets them right where they are. And then in verse 28, he even quotes one of their own rappers or poets. Acts 17, 28. For in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of our own poets have said, or some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring, and he's quoting a poet that they would have been familiar with. He's using that as a bridge to open up the door to share the truth that they have heard about, but it's disconnected from the God they need to know, and he's using a different approach because he's before a different audience. Our message will never change. Truth is truth, no matter how many years go by. Say amen. There are principles of scripture that are woven all throughout, and they are eternal. And it doesn't matter what's happening in culture. Nothing negates the truth of God's word. Say amen. amen. But culture changes. And from generation to generation, we have to understand that we're frequently positioned in front of a fresh audience and figuring out a way to walk a path to introduce them to Jesus, to open their eyes, their ears, to listen to the saving knowledge of Christ is a responsibility that we all have individually and collectively. That's why we value at our church innovative environments. Because at times we have to use a different approach. Y'all with me say amen? I know this is uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable for some, but very easy for others. And it is a fine tightrope that the church has not always walked very well. But Paul shows us the necessity right in here in his own experience where he had to adjust his approach based on his audience. He didn't change the truth, but he adjusted his approach. The culture never dictates what we believe, but it impacts how we approach sharing what we believe. Paul knew that he had to shift that the way that he was going to introduce this group of people to Jesus in the Areopagus was so different than the audience he sat before in the synagogue, and he had the courage to innovate. He had the courage to move. He had the courage to shift his approach because he stood before a group of people that he knew needed what he had. And sometimes I wonder if in the church we fail to move in areas that we should and we call it obedience when reality is just stubbornness. And we need to have the maturity to know the difference. We need to be willing to innovate, to change, to shift things. I'm, I'm grateful that we have multiple expressions of church all across this county. And I'm grateful that in a couple weeks, we get to share the same space with those churches. God made it really clear why we do church. He left a lot of room for how we could do it because he is sovereign and he knows what will take to reach one generation and one culture will be different from the next generation and the, uh, another culture. The truth doesn't change. The message doesn't change. And I'm not talking about just the message of Jesus, the standard by which God has called followers of Christ to live. That doesn't change either. Y'all with me? but we have to be willing to innovate. But there's some things I want you to know in this realm. 
I wrote this in my journal over the last couple of weeks. A desire for innovation is not a hatred for tradition. A desire for innovation is not a hatred for tradition. There are some really good and beautiful things about tradition. There are some traditions that, that we have built over the last 17 years as a church. It's a tradition that every single fall we do a series called Live Love. We will do that again. It's a series, it's, it's a tradition that we do things like Sabbath Sunday because we want to honor our volunteers and give them rest. Traditions are good. It's not a hatred for tradition. It's not, look at me, it's not a hatred even for traditional things. This church doesn't look like the one I grew up in. I mean, I grew up in, you didn't have this kind of stuff on the stage. You had two instruments, a piano on one side and an organ on the other. And some dude stood up and said, would you please turn in your hymnal to number 412? We will do the first, third, and the chorus three times. And then if you didn't know no better, you'd like, that dude's trying to land a plane. What is happening? Look at me. I'm playing, but you know what? There's still places where that works and praise God. If it works, that I, this is not a hatred for tradition. Nothing that we do here as a church is in rebellion to what I experienced. It's not in rebellion to what I experienced. It's a reflection of the people that God's brought here and their, their personalities. And there are certain things that we've just decided to use because we think it'll reach people that maybe some other churches aren't reaching. And that's the thing. Like, we're not in competition with other churches. We're in, we're, we're in a war with the enemy. <laughs> but can we all be honest? There's a time when we fall more in love with our traditions than the God that they were supposed to point to. And that's when it gets bad. When we're, we, we want to protect, when, we're, when, we want, when more, we're more in love with our tradition than we are broken over people that are far from God. It's not a desire for innovation that's a hatred for tradition. This is the way I describe it. It's a willingness to pivot when it's ineffective or inefficient. That's what I mean by innovative environment. It's a willingness to pivot when it's ineffective or inefficient. Paul knew in Athens, as he walked around and saw the culture, he's like, I ain't gonna be able to reach them the way I've reached some. Like, I'm gonna have to pivot. I'm gonna, have, I'm, gonna have to, I'm gonna have to change my message. I'm gonna have to find a different way to engage them with the truth of the gospel. It's a willingness to pivot when it's ineffective or inefficient. But again, just like trying to be in the world and not of the world is a difficult place to, nav to navigate and a tension to hold. Even, even in the church sometimes, it feels like it's a hard tension of, of, we have, of, of being creative without compromise. You know, it's, it's still so weird to me, though, that some of the things, that, there's a lot of people that think that the way we do church is, is compromise. They look at this and they're like, well, all that stuff's of the world, drums are of the devil. <laughs> and, you know, here, and here's the thing, like, I know that some of the things that maybe we use were, were, are used in the world, but my thing is, why do they get to have a say what it's used for? Why well, can't we say, you know what, nah, we're gonna, we're gonna use them for God's glory. You don't get to have them. And what, what we have to do, though, is, is be careful that we don't do change just for change's sake, that we don't get caught just trying to be cool instead of being effective. And what we can never do is, is compromise sound doctrine and theology. This is the way I wrote it in my notes. It's about adjusting our methodology while protecting our theology. That, yeah, we, we may change our approach, but we're not changing the truth. Even when it's offensive, even when it's difficult, even when it may cause some people to want to walk away. We have to preach God's word, all of it. It's about adjusting our methodology 
while protecting our theology. Paul knew that he would have to adjust his approach according to his audience in order to tell them the truth. He knew he had what they needed. And collectively, we have to always be willing to adapt. There's one thing that we say around vintage. The one, things that, the one thing that never changes is things always change. Because you know what? If we started something new today and it took time, energy, and money, but tomorrow we figured out we could do it better, let's do it better. If what we're doing has more potential to help people understand the beautiful, powerful gospel that's been entrusted to us, let's do it. Let's adapt. Let's find a path to share the gospel. Let's be so broken for people that we're willing to do what we need to do to help them come to know Christ. Let's be willing to find common ground with even the people that are most different for us, to find that common thread to hold onto so that it opens up the door for us to speak truth and hope and life and power into their lives. I wanna live the way Paul describes he decided to live in 1 Corinthians chapter nine. Go there with me and we're gonna finish with this. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 19 through 23. 1 Corinthians 9, 19 through 23. Paul says, although I am free from all and not anyone's slave, I have made myself a slave to everyone in order to win more people. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, like one under the law. Though I myself am not under the law to win those under the law. To those who are without the law, like one without the law, though I am not without God's law, but under the law of Christ, to win those without the law. To the weak, I became weak in order to win the weak. I have become all things to all people so that I might be, so that I might, in some possible way, save some. Verse 23, now I do all this because of the gospel so that I may share in the blessings. This is one of the more misunderstood passages that Paul ever wrote. Paul is not saying he was trying to be somebody he wasn't. He was not saying he was being inauthentic. What he was saying is that I constantly found myself in places with people that were different from me. And what I discovered is no matter how different, there was a common space for us to stand on. There was a common ground for us to find, a common thread about me and them that I could hold on to, that, I would, that would open up the door for me to speak into their lives and share the message of Jesus Christ. That that's how we're called to live that God constantly is giving you an audience with somebody and you get to use your voice to speak into their lives. And it's your responsibility to hunt for that common ground, to find that thread, to look for that window in so that you could speak hope and truth and life into them. And there's somebody in your life, look at me, there is somebody close to you that's far from God right now. And you're the one that he's appointed to be the messenger of hope to be the one to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with that one. I hope that even right now as I'm talking that people are flashing into your mind. People close to you that are far from God. People that God has strategically put in your path for the purpose of helping them find the only thing that's gonna fit the Jesus-shaped hole in their soul. The only thing that's gonna give them purpose, life, peace, joy. They need the Jesus you have. And you gotta do the hard work of figuring out how to crack the door and have that spiritual conversation in a way that might resonate and take root bring change. Would you bow your heads, close your eyes with me. Can you do me a favor? Can you ask God to bring somebody to your mind? 
Maybe it's a lot of somebodies. Maybe it's a family member. Ooh, maybe it's somebody sitting in this room. Maybe it's a classmate. Maybe it's somebody that you know that you're gonna see over the next few weeks. And you're gonna sit across the table or in some other setting. Maybe you've had that moment and it hadn't always gone well. And I know this is gonna sting, but maybe it's because you haven't allowed God to give you the wisdom and discernment. You've used truth on them like a club and you just beat them with it every time you see them. That's not what Paul did. Would you just ask God to show you that person and show you that path? Help you to find that common thread that maybe you two share that you can latch hold of with the hopes of telling them about the beautiful thing that you have in Jesus that you know they need to. We're gonna worship one more time before we get out of here. and Just use this space, how you feel that. If you wanna come and kneel and pray and just spend some time interceding on behalf of someone else, or maybe just asking God to give you wisdom, strength. Man, I'm thinking this week, I wanna be out of camp with our high schoolers and get all these opportunities to have spiritual conversations with these people that are half my age and trying to find that thread to speak life into them. Father, I pray that you would, first God, you're gonna have to break us like you broke Paul. What he saw caused him to be burdened, broken, says he was distressed, make us distressed. Distressed over the people that are close to us yet far from you. People that maybe at times we've yet to find an effective way to share our faith with. I know this, God, you haven't given up on them and we shouldn't either. So would you burden our hearts for those people? And would you give us so much wisdom and discernment? Would you give us an audience, a fresh audience with them? And would you reveal to us the pathway that we might travel, that might just, if nothing else, make them curious about your son, Jesus? It's in his name we pray.